Welcome in to the Husker 24-7 Hypecast. I am Mike Schaefer, joined <laughs> by Michael Bruns. No Brian Christofferson this week, though we do have his score prediction and a uh, oddly specific prediction to pass along as well. And the special guest this week, looks like he's in a cave, I can't really tell, uh, Gary Sharp. I'm in the office, but this the lights your... aren't on. I haven't paid the bill. <laughs> He's got the sports guy thing going though, with all the all the lanyards in the that. background. Look at that guy; he covers a lot yeah. of events. I know. I need to <laughs> frame them. That'd be good. That'd be good. What what which is the most obscure press credential you would have behind you right now? Um. Oh, I went and covered uh, when I was living in Lincoln, uh, Kai Fi Fight Night, and I saved the credential from like twenty five years ago. Nice. Wow. Okay. I, that that's legitimately obscure for me. It'd be like the one time I went to an Under Armour Bowl practice <laughs> when we were down at the Capital One, uh, the Capital One Bowl down there in Orlando. They didn't make lanyards or, or press credentials for Miller's Ale House, but I think Brunt's made one for himself during those Orlando trips. <laughs> they'll, they'll accept your mail if you ask them. Though I was there that much. <laughs> you just have people calling looking for you. Yeah. It was kind of hard to hear the phone calls when the UFC fight night was going on, but, you know, I made do. Understandable. Understandable. Well, none of that has anything to do with Nebraska's upcoming opponent, Minnesota. So we will try to get you ready for the forthcoming game between Nebraska and Minnesota here. It is the first matchup to not feature Frost versus Fleck since 2017. Nebraska is one and three over their last four games against Minnesota. All of these games, if you go back through the series since Nebraska joined the Big Ten, all of these games are sort of weird. Like every one of them has kind of a, a bizarre moment other than maybe like real early 2011, 2012. There probably isn't as much there. But starting in 2013, Taylor Martinez's last game. 2014, the game that probably got Bo Pelini fired. 2015, maybe the single best game of the Mike Riley era as they went up there and they just decimated Minnesota. Uh, 2016, 2016, I'm blanking a little bit. I think Riker Fife started the game. Nebraska was coming off of, you know, getting massacred by Ohio State uh, and they just needed to win in Lincoln. 2017, Bill Moose screaming no with his palm up against the glass <laughs> in the skybox. 2018, you've got uh, you got Nebraska. Like I think they had 300 yards rushing in that game. Maybe Adrian Martinez, maybe yeah. Adrian Martinez best overall game. Yeah, probably the best. the The game that looked the most like what Scott Frost offense was supposed to be at Nebraska. Uh, 2019 hoodies. 2020, Dedrick Mills goes 17 plays between carries, and Nebraska chooses not to run the ball against a team with like 40 players on the sidelines. Uh, and 2021, the running back stumbles at the inch line for the go-ahead score. Any Anything else you guys would like to add in this oh. award-winning series of football between Nebraska and Minnesota, uh, in which I'll never forget Sid Hartman, rest in peace, standing up and cheering in 2013 as Minnesota finally uh, beat Nebraska, and then he was recalling Tom Osborne running up the score in the 80s, and that's why he hated the Huskers. Yep, that is absolutely true. Also, remember in that same game, remember uh, Jared Afalava, the linebacker from, uh, what was it, Utah? Utah. He had to go to the bathroom, so he left the sidelines, never came back. He just sat in the locker room? Well, he disappeared. He, like, that was it. He you remember he was supposed to play, and he never played, but he had to go to the bathroom, left the sidelines, and never returned. And that was before the transfer portal. Where did he go? What happened at what was the game in uh, 17? Didn't they return the opening kickoff for a touchdown? Tanner Lee gets concussed and turns around and plays the next week at Penn State and people lose their mind if he'd been yeah. in the protocol. And Patrick O'Brien played most of the second half against Minnesota. Uh as Brunts, have you have you looked up where Demery Croft finished his career? <laughs> oh man, let me look. <laughs> come back <laughs> why is anyone still listening to this podcast right now that is a real question this is the opposite of hyped yeah yeah right. this is true the the most hyped anybody was was the first second of this podcast all right gary 
before we dive into to this game and as brunch does his research what what would be your what are what are your expectations in a game in which Nebraska is again a double digit underdog uh they're facing a team that has the Big 10 West recipe and they potentially have any number of quarterbacks that may or may not be playing for them on Saturday uh that the, when the game starts at 11 o'clock they look prepared I think they looked prepared last week I, mean, I do too they had a good game plan. They looked prepared, and then they got a curveball, and they're just not talented enough to overcome losing your starting quarterback, and then it just derails. I, I mean, I think they'll look prepared. I think they'll have – on one side of the ball, I know for sure they'll have a game plan. It's just how long that can last. Um, but you just hope that – man, whoever is the quarterback, Purdy, Smothers, Smothers, Purdy, Thompson, whoever, they have a game plan to make it simple. Like, the, who gives you the best chance to win? You don't need to be flashy. You just need to find a way to win a game. But I don't think Mark Whipple's into being simple. He's too far down the road that he's going to try and change the game and not maybe play to the strengths of a Purdy or a Smothers, which is weird because he'll do that with his other skill guys. Like, he'll play to their strengths and call plays to their strengths. So, I don't know. I'm really curious about the atmosphere because we've reached the last month. Last week, there was a ton of optimism. Didn't go so well. You wonder, is Mickey the guy? Is he not the guy? Now you're starting to hear other names, but yet you could still be bowl eligible. And there's Fleck on the other sidelines. I think this is a weird game, like a weird vibe type of game. Brunt, as you sort of, as you look at this game and you look at Anthony Grant, we didn't really see a lot out of him after a really good first drive. It felt like, there wasn't much there for him. How does Nebraska get Anthony Grant going in a game in which you could use, you know, a, a running game to kind of help out a potential backup quarterback? Doubling back first, uh, Demery Croft finished his career at Tennessee Tech <laughs> under some very uh, – he had some charges that he was facing, um, very serious charges. So I, I, I that, that's the most recent I could find in 2019. Right. So Thank now, you, now that we're caught up there, yeah. Um, Anthony Grant, I think, I think Nebraska has to scheme some, some things up to, to get him going. I mean, it, the thing that I'm still not completely straight on is, is this Minnesota defense. I mean, they're, they're very highly ranked. They can, they, they basically know who they are and they're, they're going to make you earn everything. I think they're going to have to find some ways to get Grant open in space. The, the other thing too, I mean, if you even go back and look at that game against Illinois, th there were some holes there if, if he would have found them and some opportunities for some big plays that, you know, if, if he just cuts it up and, and inside rather than trying to bounce it, um, you know, you could maybe, he could have gotten some things done there. But I think, I think the thing that Nebraska can't do is it can't give up on Anthony Grant. And it, and it can't give up on the run game because if, if it becomes clear that, you know, that they're going to have Purdy or Smothers or Thompson or whatever combo of those guys just chucking it down the field, I, I think that's a really bad recipe for Nebraska. So whatever that offensive approach is on the ground, I, I just think you have to keep doing it. You can't have one of those games where, you know, you, you try Anthony Grant for part of the first quarter, part of the second, and then you just don't see him again. Last week, we saw Trey Palmer sort of taken out of the game by his own team and by the other team. Nebraska unable to get him the ball early with Casey Thompson. They just couldn't connect on a couple routes and, and looked like there were some opportunities. And then again with Chubba Purdy as well. Gary, as you sort of look at it, how do you get Trey Palmer involved, even if maybe you don't have the best downfield passing game going into Saturday? Well, I think, one, it's unfortunate Thompson isn't playing because he's got a Palmer's got a better matchup this week on just the way that Minnesota plays their wide receivers with their coverage in the back end. Um, I think it's going to be a lot of quick game. I could see, you know, kind of the Rutgers game plan that they adjusted to as they fell behind in that game where they had more Grant out of the backfield throwing the football. Um, they also were pretty quick to the sidelines to get like a Trey Palmer in space. I could see him using that, but I think they need to not say to Chubber or Logan, hey, F it. Palmer's down there somewhere, just chuck it up. I think they need to have a dedicated plan, but I think it's just getting the ball out quick, a little quick passes, short passing game, and let Palmer catch it and then try and make a move. You know, I don't think they need a house call every time. This is going to be a game that's once again going to be played in the phone booth. So it's okay 
you don't need 17. You could take seven and go, hey, that's a win for us. So I think that's the way to get him involved. But I think he'll bounce back because he won't get eaten up like he did against Illinois. But maybe Minnesota, until they start calling it, will be as handsy on him as Illinois was. Brunts against Illinois, we saw a couple guys, Alante Brown, Chancellor Brewington, come up with a few catches and uh, combined for nearly 100 yards. And, and guys that just haven't been thought of as, as you know, big pieces for your passing offense. Is there anybody else that you're sort of looking for that could potentially emerge this week? Or it, do you, could we see a continuation for Alante Brown? I thought that was the best that we saw from him uh, in his, his career so far. He seems like a guy that that's getting better as the year's gone along. Um, I, I think he's getting a little bit more comfortable and in, in more of a featured role than, than maybe what he's done in the past. Um, th- this to me seems like a game where, you know, like Gary's saying, quick, quick passes, get it out quick, where you, you might see a little bit more tight end involvement. Um, you know, certainly vocal I, I think Brewington, the, the, the play that they drew up for him was, was really nice. I mean, it, it was a, an actual successful screen, um, which, I mean, they, they build, they should build statues for that around here, the way things have gone sometimes. But the, I, I think those, that group can have a little bit of a bigger game, especially if there's, you know, more attention being paid to Palmer and, and kind of how you try to shut, how you try to shut him down. And plus, you know, I, I just think that the shorter stuff is, is a better fit for Purdy and, and, and Smothers. And, you know, when we've seen Logan Smothers, that that's when he's kind of, been at his best is the quick short stuff get him out of the pocket and moving so I, I look for the tight ends and, and maybe a back or two to be a little bit more featured in the passing game than what they have been Gary on on your show which is essentially sharp and friends on 1620 yeah. Monday through Friday from 6 a.m to 10 a.m I want to make sure that I, I Thank you. appreciate you know, that push people there we, Friends, we discussed way, today not my friend Schaefer has been on the show so <laughs> I'm saying maybe Nobody Brunts can be a friend someday. Yeah. Maybe Brunts can be. A I, I, I want to be friend zoned. Oh no! <laughs> well, that got weird. All right. <laughs> so we we talked about how even though Chase Brown still ended up with with his general average for his numbers, it felt like Nebraska's defense was did what they needed to do to put Nebraska in a position to compete in that game. Is it a similar strategy against Minnesota? On Saturday? I think so. And I agree with you. Before Casey went out, Nebraska defensively, so they had the breakdown of the touchdown. Anytime Mesh is going against man, I'm going to take Mesh. And there were a couple of times of miscommunication where a tight end was uncovered and Illinois had a good play call. But in terms of Chase Brown, they had held him down before the uh, interception that's returned all the way to the 13-yard line that basically his offensive line pushed him to the one-yard line. Outside, I mean, up to that point, Nebraska did a good job of containing him, but they also tackled him. Um, and I think they're going to need that even more so with Ibrahim uh, coming up on Saturday. But I, I think there's a game plan of what they did against Brown that they can do against Minnesota because I liked what they were doing defensively. Hey, let's be honest. Bill Bush in a month, they've given up two second-half touchdowns in four games. So the defense with all of its warts and who's playing where – they have at least given you a chance. They haven't crumbled. Um, and they have definitely performed better, some individuals, and they're in better sp- spots. There's some things you're not going to be able to overcome because of the roster and the depth. But I think that game plan against Illinois, against the top back, I think they can use it again this weekend. But they, they might have to gang tackle a little bit more than they did against Chase Brown. Brunson, now coming into this game, the thing with Minnesota that has been an issue for Nebraska in past years They've done really well with RPO. They they set it up well. They catch Nebraska perfectly. The ends for Nebraska have tended to, to kind of suck in a little bit and fight hard on that. And Tanner Morgan, even though he's less than 100 yards, I think, rushing this year, he does have the ability to, to kind of get out and move a little bit. Is the RPO your number one concern beyond Ibrahim on, yeah. on uh, Saturday? Yeah. I mean, that that's Minnesota's just feasted on that in, in recent years. And I, I'm curious with Bill Bush if you see a little bit more tighter coverage on the outside because I think that's always been the thing that was just maddening against Minnesota was you you had the quick RPO stuff combined with way too much cushion on the outside and it was like you know seven on seven or, or throwing on air at times. Um, so I, I think they have to find ways to make those tougher throws. 
I think you got to get some pressure. Um, you know, I think they've schemed up some things a little bit better. And in order to do that, you've got to win on first down. But yeah, the, the RPO stuff, I think, is a, a huge concern because at least if you can contain that or, or at least make Minnesota have to work a little bit harder at that than, than you have in the past, I think the defense can can hold up OK. Um, you know, like Gary said, I mean, the, the defense has been pretty solid. They were put in some really tough spots last week uh, by, by the offense. So th- that that game plan, plus I, I think a little bit tighter on the outside, and I think you have you know the guys where you can trust them a little bit on the outside to play physical. So we'll see if they change, but that, that is my huge concern uh, going into this one. Gary, last year around this time, you would have seen or, or you would have said that guys like Luke Reimer and Quentin Newsom – have made pretty big jumps and, and are important pieces for Nebraska's defense. Has there been a player through eight games on the defensive side that that maybe you thought was going to be important and has now, you know, kind of elevated his level of play? Has anybody kind of improved for you or stood out for you as the season has gone along on the defensive Miles, side of the ball? Miles Farmer. Um, I was very suspect on him, especially the second half of last year. Because I thought he was in a bad spot. He didn't tackle real well. You can see that his confidence has grown. I mean, essentially, Buford, Newsom, and Farmer don't come off the field on defense. I mean, they play almost every single snap. And he's not somebody that's all Big Ten quality. But he is. he has grown as the season has gone on. So that would be my guy for 22 that has probably grown the most during the season that has played in the past. Like there's some young guys that haven't played much that we see where they're at, like a Buford, but I would go with farmer. Brunt, is there, is there a strategy that Nebraska can employ to actually create pressure? I know you mentioned that kind of in your, in your answer, but it just, I, the thing that I think is maddening with Nebraska's defense is you get some weeks like Indiana and Rutgers, where it feels like they can really bear down on a team. And then you get others like Purdue, which against a third string offensive lineman, it felt like they weren't able to get much pressure. And then even last week against uh, Tommy DeVito, it seemed like he was comfortable for most of the time. It, it, does it? Is it just come down to, to dialing up the right blitz at the right time? I think so. I mean, I think I think you're playing better offensive lines now, probably too, than you were at the start sure. of the conference season. Um so, yeah, I mean, I, I just think this defense is one that, you know, you, you don't have a ton of guys that are just going to line up and win a one-on-one matchup. I mean, I, I think you were hoping that O'Shawn Mathis would be that guy. He hasn't really popped yet. I think Garrett Nelson can be, you know, maybe once or twice a game. Um, but I think if in order to kind of have that consistent pressure, I mean, I think you do have to kind of scheme things up. And you saw a little bit of that last week. I mean, that you got Isaac Gifford. Uh, in the backfield, and he's one guy I'd probably add to Gary's answer that's kind of grown pretty well as the season's gone along. And, and you know, the, you had Reimer finally back healthy and, and kind of getting after the quarterback. I, it just It's going to have to be a scheme thing for me just because I don't know that with the way the roster is, you have that guy that you can count on on third down to really go and get in the quarterback's face. And you saw that, you know, I mean, DeVito was, what, 20 for 22? I mean, he was – just lights out on the short stuff. So it's got to be schemed to me. All right. It is time for oddly specific predictions. We don't have Brian Christopherson with us right now, but he did send along his oddly specific prediction. So I'm going to go ahead and read that off. Give Brunts and Gary a little more time to, to fine tune what they're going to say here. But BC, as he has predicted, I think at least two other times that I can remember in this segment, is going with a Logan Smothers throws a touchdown on a 43-yard pass where he pulls back from an option, an old-school Husker option, and he hits Alante Brown for the touchdown. This is the Jamal Lord special for those of you playing at home. Did he have a yardage? He gave 43 yards. (laughs) Very specific. Oddly, some might say. All right, Gary, what do you got? So I will go with um, a strip sack of Tanner Morgan and a scoop and carry it down within the shadow of the goal line by Garrett Nelson. Wow. Look at that. A scoop sack. Nebraska, I think, has recovered two fumbles this year. (laughs) 
No, nope, three. They got to their third when uh, Isaiah Williams just set the ball gently on the turf. For uh, How is that even possible, by the way? They have the worst fumble luck in the country. If you go back and you look, and put some of it is, is they don't force enough. They have, I think, recovered somewhere in the neighborhood of 20 fumbles over six seasons. That is not very good at all. Like, it is not uh, – it's, it's inexplicable. Like, you have some teams that recover 20 in a year. Anyways, Brunt. I'll go defensive. I think I think you get a Quentin Newsom pick in this game. I think he, he, he somehow gets in there on an RPO – Something, some, some kind of quick slant action gets in there, gets a pick. I don't think he returns it though. I think it's a, it's a quick bang bang play, makes the pick straight to the ground. But I think it's probably going to happen around Minnesota's thirty-five yard line. I'm going to say they're going to spot it at the thirty-six. Uh, gets Nebraska going. The offense doesn't do much on the next possession, and you get a Timmy Bleak Road field goal. But uh, Quentin Newsom pick followed by a Bleak Road field goal um, at some point. For, for Nebraska. I like it. Uh, I am, I'm going to go with this. Nebraska has a possession inside the five going in to score. Chancellor Brewington goes in motion. The Minnesota defender knows what is coming. He steals himself up to be hit. And then when he looks up, Chancellor Brewington has run past him and catches a play action touchdown of five yards Ooh. inside the red zone. Chancellor Brewington, five yard touchdown. Reception. I have no idea who the hell's throwing that ball. I'm not going to tell you. I don't know. Doesn't matter. Doesn't matter. Five yard Chancellor Brewington touchdown. All right. Pick to click. I will. I'll go ahead and start. I'm going to piggyback off of what Brunt said uh, with Quentin Newsom. I think he's playing some pretty good football right now. He had a pretty good game. That one play with Isaiah Williams aside, had a pretty good game against Illinois. I also agree that he will walk away with an interception. Quentin Newsom, good game against. Minnesota Brunts. Um, I, I think I always go to the vocal like well, um, and he clicked just very briefly last week. He, um, one catch, one touchdown. The efficiency that's is cunning. That's a click. Um, I'll go with Brewington. I, I think the Titans are going to get involved. I, I think it's going to be Brewington's week. Um, I'll go, I'll go along with Schaefer's five yard um, five yard prediction for a touchdown. Also, maybe a second week in a row, an unprecedented screen success to Chancellor Brewington. Uh, so he's going to pick to click. I'm going to stay with uh, the tight end room, and I want to go Vokalek because all I can think of is when Nebraska was trying to rally last year in Minnesota, they all of a sudden found a tight end in the red zone and in the end zone. His name was Austin Allen. That was kind of rare, but it almost helped him get back into the game and uh, come from behind and win. So I'm going to stick with Vokalek. And a pick-to-click, oddly specific prediction is he is open in the end zone in the corner and he is overthrown. Just paraphrasing here, that was one of my favorite interviews last year where Austin Allen basically said, I've been available to do that all year after making that catch. <laughs> so yeah. remember, remember how we started this about things that happen against Minnesota and you go, what? Yeah. All right. Uh, score prediction time. Will anyone be brave enough to take Nebraska to win this game? Will anyone take Nebraska to cover? Yes, yes, someone will. BC is going 29-17 Minnesota. Brooks. Uh, I'm I'm envisioning low scoring. I'm, I'm thinking Nebraska is going to cover. I'm expecting a four-quarter-ish kind of game. Um I think Minnesota is going to have just a little too much on the ground for Nebraska. I'm going to say Minnesota 23, Ooh. Nebraska 16. Ooh. All right. In a fourth quarter. I will Dude. say that this game will be three to 10 points throughout the contest. It will get to the fourth quarter. People will be oddly trying to figure out what's going on. And all of a sudden, they'll get excited in the fourth quarter. It'll be a close game. But I see Minnesota pulling it out 27-17, and Minnesota becomes bowl eligible. All right. It's going to be a clean sweep. I got Minnesota 21, Nebraska 10. Just don't see a lot of points on uh, 
on Saturday, but uh, well, we'll see. Uh, anything can happen when these teams get together. And they've anything. covered. So, they've, the, so I mean, Nebraska getting 16. I mean, yeah, take it to the bank, cover. baby. This is a bloodbath guarantee. <laughs> All right, Gary, we appreciate your time joining us here on the Husker 24-7 Hypecast. I appreciate it. Let's go. Is that what you're supposed to do? Is that what I'll guess? Like, let's get hyped. <laughs> you're the first one to ever say it back to me. Yeah. Really? That's how they should be the greeting. That, that's Husker Hypecast history right there. Yeah. Impressive I mean, all stuff. those other people that have been on this, I've seen them. <laughs> yeah. All right. Everyone Thanks, be guys. sure to check out Everyone be sure to check out Husker247.com. Plenty of coverage leading up to the game. Plenty of coverage after the game. Big visit weekend. Lots of recruits in. Some notable 2024s, some 2025s. Even a couple 2026s sprinkled in there as Nebraska's recruiting operation has not slowed down, even though it does not yet have a full-time head coach. Of course, basketball gets underway as well on Monday. We'll have more podcasts next week. So be sure to keep it on Husker 24-7.